Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. We are so glad that you are able to join us today. I am sitting here in sunny, beautiful southeast Missouri down by Cape Girardeau. The weather has been uh, just wonderful the last couple of days. Lots of people out getting gardening done and we are starting to get a little dry, um, but hopefully we have a few wet rain showers. I hope we have a good weather report today. Um, we have lots of great information for you today. Those that are sending in questions, please send, keep sending them in. We love those questions. And that way we have plenty of content to offer you from week to week. Um, I am going to put the map up real quick. And I know we always say this, but always look at that map and see who's supposed to be covering your area. Um, if there's a vacancy or an empty spot, just look to the next person. That is the one that you would be calling if you had questions uh, throughout the week or throughout the garden summer. Um, so um, uh, Kathy has changed her name to ask your questions here. So at any time during this presentation, if you have any questions, just go over to the chat box, look for ask your questions here and just type it in. Um, if we get close to the end of the program, Make sure that you add your email address because if we run out of time, we want to still be able to get a hold of you and uh, get your questions answered. Um, so definitely someone will be in touch with you to answer it. Uh, we are gonna start today with the weather report. And today we have Debbie Kelly, who's filling in for uh, Tony Lupo. She's going to do his program. And um, if you'll bear with me a minute, I'm gonna switch over um, the PowerPoints. Um, and then I will turn it over to Debbie. Okay. Okay, Debbie, it's your turn. Yes, thank you. So um, Tony is actually at the Midwest Regional Climate Center, and he is actually engaged at this moment in time. So he's not able to do the presentation. So he sent an email with things that could be said on each slide. So I'm going to do the best that I possibly can. Uh, when it comes to the weather forecast. And if you've got questions, I know Tony would be more than happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. So let's go ahead and get started, Donna. Okay, so what this slide actually is showing is our temperatures for uh, yesterday and for today. And as you can see, the red is where we're kind of at. That's in the, the low 70s to the to the the high 70s to the low 80s um, with some pretty nice nice weather that we've been having. And I've been enjoying these days wanting to be outside and not in my office. So let's go ahead. All righty. So um, on this slide, um, we're seeing that there is still no strong surface front or low pressures that are anywhere across our country. Uh, so we are trapped under high pressure. And what that really means is that we're having this beautiful weather, uh, blue skies, few clouds, also means that we have dew points that are in the upper 40s and the low 50s. And when dew points are that low this time of the year, it indicates that things are pretty dry out there when we have those, those sorts of low dew points. Okay, Donna? What we're seeing here is actually a high ridge. So you can see in the upper Midwest, like around the Dakotas and Minnesota, where it kind of goes up there, that that is the high ridge. And that's indicating that everything below it is having just this beautiful weather uh, being cloud free. Next slide. So we have two different maps here. The one on the left is showing the um, rain from last month. Um, it is still showing that we did get some, but it's small amounts of rains. We are still below normal. As you can see on the right side, the right is showing the deviation from what normal is. So left slide, left picture is what we've received. The right picture is showing that we are dry, that we're not meeting the amount of precipitation that we normally would at this time of year for the past uh, history of, of whatever those dates are up there. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my, my, my notes instead of at the pictures, but if you can see those dates up there on the slide. The next slide, please. 
Okay, so what we're looking at is um, cocoa rust. And I've actually found this to be really interesting. Um, you as, a, as an individual person out in the world can go ahead and sign up at cocoa rust. You can uh, purchase a really nice rain gauge and then you create your own account out there. And then every day you just put into that your account what the temperature is, what the skies look like, if there's any precipitation, inches of snow, there is a little bit of an online training that you can go through. And I have very seriously thought about doing that because it seems to be really interesting. My thing is, is that I really can't do it every single day at the exact time or time frame because sometimes I have to get up early and go someplace. Sometimes I work in the evenings, so it varies for me. But when I retire, I'll do it. That's for sure. Uh, the next slide. So this is indicating our drought conditions. Um, as we knew last year, the drought was really bad out on the uh, western uh, side of the US. As we can see now, it's in the middle. There's one more slide, Donna. And so this is what it looked like on the left side. That's what it looked like um, a little bit ago, a short time ago. It, you can see how it's actually changed from one week to the next week. If you notice, and if we had a map of just Missouri, uh, there's like a big target over Columbia, Missouri, and then there's some in like a little bit of Montauk, Cooper, and, and um, area that that area right there has got some some red areas of drought. So they they are having some real concerns uh, when it comes to precipitation. Okay, Donna. So April and May, what did it look like versus our uh, March and April versus what it looked like in May? Um, and so what that one is, is um, I've lot, what number slide is this, Donna? Do you know? Uh, no. See, um, this is what happens when Tony's not around. We'll get better <laughs> next time Tony's I'm, not here, I'm guys. I'm sorry. It is slide eight. I just slide eight. Okay. So um, temperatures. Uh, for May, we were cool last week. Um, we are getting a little bit uh, closer to our normal temperature of what we would have, uh, but there are a few places that actually fell behind that were a little bit cooler uh, than even other sections of the state. He didn't go uh, into detail about that, and we are behind in rain is what I had said in a slide before. So the next one, please. Okay, and so we can see we can see where the yellow is the going across, and we can see how it was more or less straight across last week. This week, it's got a little bit of a dip along in that line, um, and so that is um, another indication of of the kinds of temperature that we're having right now. And if we go to the next slide. Um, he's saying that actually there's not much that's really happening that's different. We're just kind of in this pattern and have been. But what's interesting on this slide is you see the dark red up in Canada on the far right. That is a high pressure anomaly because if you see it's slowly moving to the west. Normally our, our weather moves from the west to the east, but that anomaly is actually moving towards the west. If it stays together, then chances are towards the latter part of June, we could have some precipitation uh, that's going to follow along with that. But if that breaks apart, chances are we're going to continue to stay dry throughout a good portion of the summer. Okay. And this is just indicating what our rain forecast is for the next seven weeks, or at least the prediction, or seven days for the, the prediction. Um, you'll notice that Missouri, um, there's still that those dry areas up north. There's just a little bit. That's only like one-tenth to a quarter of an inch of rain, so that's really not a lot. We always like to say we want one inch of water at least a week for our plants to grow. So if you're not out there watering, you probably should be. And don't forget to water those trees and shrubs as well, because they need just as much water as our fruits and our vegetables and our lawn. The next slide. So we're looking at a new summer outlook. Meteorologically, summer is June 1st through August 31st. There's nothing right now that's indicating throughout the summer that we're going to deviate too much from what our normal temperatures are, at least for Missouri. Maybe the southern, very southern part might be there. But the Climate Prediction Center 
um, is still positive about having summer rain, just like the slide before that Tony had predicted. So they're both on that same page. Um, as long as that anomaly of that pressure stays together and continues to move towards the west. Okay. And then this one is talking about a six to 10 day outlook. We're still going to be warm and we're still going to be dry. So definitely the eastern part of Missouri is in that, that tan color over there. And so those of us on the eastern side do pay attention to the amount of precipitation we're getting or not getting. Next one. And so this one is uh, indicating uh, the forecast for the next three to four weeks, which again, our temperatures are indicated there will be slightly above normal. And then the the water and rain precipitation is going to be low to uh, in the northern and eastern sections of the state. And the southern part of the state, uh, predominantly the southwest and south central, uh, may be a normal, or at least that's what they're hoping or seeing or predicting at this one point. Next one. And this is just Tony's Facebook page. If you guys are interested in following him and learning some information, uh, I've learned a lot since Tony's come on, uh, but not good enough to be the best weather reporter as such as what he is. And then the next slide is going to give us um, the weekend out outlook for the next four to five days. Um, essentially what this is saying is that it's going to be a really, really nice weekend. There is a slight chance for some type of precipitation in some areas of the state, but essentially high, seven, high 70s, low 80s, um, and it's just going to be a gorgeous weekend. I don't know about you, but I know I'm going to enjoy the weekend, and this is a very debified weather report. Uh, thank you, Debbie. This is that has been a great weather report. Awesome job. So at this point, I will turn it over to Ra Ramon as your moderator. Um, thank you, Donna. And thank you, Debbie. That was great. Even though with no experience, it's a very good uh, presentation. Um, well, as a moderator, I'm going to go through the questions that we had uh, for, for this week. And again, to remind you, if you have any question, please type it in the chat box and we'll see if we can answer it today or if not next week. Uh, our first question for this week was uh, for the local homeowner who is wanting to plant three, four blueberry plants. What kind of small package soil amendments are available to lower the pH? It seems a little excessive for them to visit the co-op or, or MFA to push a large amount of sulfur when only little is needed. Also, can a single blueberry plant produce fruit on its own or does it need to be planted in a row of multiple blueberry plants or near other fruit plants such as blackberry? And we have Patrick Byers to answer this question and address this, uh, these questions. Patrick. Excellent. Thank you, Ramon. Um, can you hear me okay? Is the audio good? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, let me share my screen here. And let's talk a little bit about blueberries. And of course, the thing about blueberries is they are an interesting fruit crop from the standpoint of the soil. So I'm, this question is, is an excellent question. It actually comes up quite frequently. Now, when we think about a good soil for blueberries, there's three characteristics that we really need to look at carefully. And those are the soil pH, the level of organic matter, and whether or not that soil is well drained. And uh, I will say at this point, and probably will say again later on, that a soil test is very helpful when assessing a spot for blueberries. Because some of these things, I mean, you can certainly understand drainage by, by looking at the site and perhaps digging some holes and filling them with water and seeing how quickly they drain. But when it comes to pH and organic matter, the soil test will give you the data that you need to know. So here's our targets. The, the uh, soil should have a pH of 4.8 to 5.2. We should have an organic matter content of at least 3% and, and higher than 3% is very helpful. And so in reality, many of our soils uh, will, will fall short on one or the other. And having that soil test will help us understand what we need to do uh, as blueberry growers to, to make the soil suitable for, for blueberries. Oh, Patrick. Oh, there you go. Okay, hold on a second here. 
So again, looking at the uh, soil test report, uh, it will come back with a pH level. And if it's in the range of 4.8 to 5.2, then you're right where you need to be. Some other things to look at on the, uh, the uh, soil test report are the calcium levels. And a standard soil test report will give you the level of calcium in your soil. And a good blueberry soil should have uh, a maximum of 2,000 pounds per acre of calcium. And then take a look at the uh, CEC, the, the uh, cation exchange capacity. This will be on your soil test report as well. And if it's below 18, that's very helpful as well. Now, other uh, bits of information on the, the um, soil test, things such as phosphorus levels and potassium levels, not quite as important as, as what we've mentioned already. So let's take a look at three soil test reports and get a feel for whether these would be good spots to plant blueberries. And if we look at the first one, boy, that has a high soil pH and and has a high calcium content. So this likely would be a challenging place to grow blueberries. Looking at the second, the uh, test in, report in the middle, pH of 6.4, calcium content of, uh, gosh, almost 4,000 pounds per acre, and uh, uh, CEC of 12.3. This is gonna be a borderline soil from the standpoint of making it suitable for blueberries. Uh, we can work with soils that have these characteristics, but we're going to have to do some things, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. The uh, lowest test, uh, we have a nice soil pH right in the range for blueberries. We have a good organic matter content, and we have a fabulous CEC. Now, this is the exception, not the rule. So get that soil test. That will help guide you in making decisions to make that site suitable for blueberries. So again, um, if your soil test report comes back with a need for lowering the soil pH, this is typically done with two, uh, one of, of two options. One is to apply elemental sulfur. The other is to apply iron sulfate. And both of these materials are available in small homeowner scale packaging. I recently sourced some elemental sulfur and found it in a, in a two pound bag, which was you know, just about right for a small uh, uh, scale blueberry planting. Now, the amount that you need to apply is going to be present on the soil test report. You know, I can certainly give you some rules of thumb, but it's much better to have the data from a soil test report in hand to make this informed decision. Make sure that you apply either elemental sulfur or iron sulfate in advance of planting. Uh, six months is a good thing. So for example, if you're thinking about planting blueberries in the spring, then you really need to have amended the soil with sulfur or iron sulfate the previous growing season. If you're thinking about planting in the fall, well, make your changes in the spring. Oftentimes we need to adjust organic matter content too. And since this wasn't part of the original question, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but blueberries do benefit from organic matter additions. So things such as green manure or cover crops, actual additions of compost before planting and using some uh, moist peat moss in the planting hole as well can be very helpful and then maintain an organic mulch around those blueberry plants from, from planting onward. Now, the question also uh, was wondering about pollination requirements for blueberries. Now, blueberries are self-fertile, and this means that if you have just one bush, or if all of your bushes are the same cultivar, you can expect a good blueberry crop. There is some evidence that if you provide for cross-pollination, which means, again, more than one uh, cultivar present in your planting, that you'll see a bit of a bump in yields, but not absolutely necessary. Uh, kind of an interesting side note, uh, bumblebees are excellent pollinators for blueberries and bumblebees and blueberries evolve together and they are ideally suited for, from the standpoint of, um, when I say they, the floral structure on the blueberry and the activity, the pollinating activity of a bumblebee are ideally suited for accomplishing pollination. Okay, with that, um, Hopefully we've answered that that particular question. Back to you, Ramon. Thank you, Patrick. Perhaps if you can let the, the client know where can she find or when, where can he find a, a small amount of sulfur? You mentioned I've seen it in certain stores, but uh, do you have any suggestion? Well, um, so I, I don't like to mention specific businesses because, of course, we don't want to show favoritism, but. I have located uh, elemental sulfur and iron sulfate as well at uh, lawn and garden stores and local nurseries. So that's where I would start my search. It might be possible to find it also at some of our large home improvement stores as well. Uh, these are common amendments for soils uh, 
with with plants such as rhododendrons, azaleas, blueberries, and and in any setting where the soil pH needs to be lowered. So these are common materials for that use. So you should be able to find them in smaller quantities. Very well, thank you, Patrick. So unless there is another a question about it, I will go to another uh, the other question of the uh, for this week. And it's related to monarch caterpillar pup pupas. I mean, where do monarch ca caterpillar pupate? I have had, uh, had many uh, caterpillars on my butterfly milkweed, uh, then they just disappear. Are they hiding somewhere to pupate? And uh, Kathy is going to answer this question for all of us. Thanks, Ramon. Um, Yes, they are hiding. Actually, they're probably seeking protection from predators. And here you can see a monarch uh, chrysalis hanging from a branch. And just in case anyone doesn't know, uh, the life cycle of uh, a monarch butterfly follows a complete life cycle. So from egg, larva, pupae, and uh, to adult. And so the female lays between 100 and 300 eggs on a host plant. Um, the mon uh, a, a milkweed plant, and after the eggs hatch, a larva emerges and feeds on on the milkweed. Um, they go through four molts over a ten to fourteen day period, leaving, and then they leave the host plant to start the pupation process. So that's when you have seen them leave, and they can go. Um, 15 to 20 feet away, and they can be found hanging from other plants uh, or any number of places in your yard, they might find a hide. Um, a lip of a pot, I have seen them there before. Um, the lip of the house siding. And uh, here you can see one on a vine, an older vine, but they can be a lot of different places, garden statues, uh, the handle of a watering can, barbecue grill, on tree trunks, window screens, bird baths, you name it, they can probably be there. So that's uh, all I have. And just know that uh, if you've planted the milkweed, you are helping them out and, and uh, doing your job. And then they are going to seek protection um while they uh go into the next stage thank you thank you kathy that's great information now i'm sure i'm not gonna wash my house in the middle of the summer <laughs> when they when the pupate uh, the pupa uh, might be hanging somewhere in the in the side of the house that's yeah. right <laughs> better wait to the winter anyway we'll go to our next question for this week and it says I have bull blood beads. I noticed that, uh, that a few were a bit yellow this week. And when I looked under the leaf, I was seeing what looks like egg floating in the air right below the leaf, but was actually attached via a fine thread of leaf. That's a very important uh, notice. A very good that the person uh, looked closer to what she, uh, they have. And Debbie is going to address this uh, question. Debbie? Yeah. So um, it, this was a picture that was actually sent in. So those of you that have questions for us, you're more than welcome uh, to send us pictures. A lot of times pictures are extremely helpful because they can, uh, you can describe something and say it's green. And I may think of this color green when in reality, you're thinking this color shade of green. So pictures are helpful. So just so you know, if you've got a question, send it in, send pictures. We'd love to see your pictures. Okay, so the question really boils down to, you know, we're seeing these, these things that are kind of sticking off of our, our beet plant off of the leaves and the leaves are turning a little bit yellow. Um, I can also see some other types of little bit of damage. I don't know for sure exactly uh, what might be causing. It looks like it's something is actually chewing, which probably tells me it could be a beetle or it could be a caterpillar of some sort, but I don't see any indication specifically of anything other than these one, two, three, four things that are sticking out. They're kind of cool looking. So they want to know really, is this what's causing the damage to the beet plant? So let's look. 
It's actually a lace wing is what that is. It's the eggs of a lace wing. Lace wings are beneficial insects. So if you see that on any of your garden plants or flowers, don't try to get rid of them. You want to keep them there. They come as either a green lace wing or a brown lace wing. They do distribute their eggs and then they, they will uh, become a larva. And eventually around infested plants is where they actually are going to be for where their food source is. So they, they will lay their eggs on the plants. They will pupate out or the eggs will hatch. They'll become a larva. They do have a tendency to cannibalize uh, each other. So if you see them uh, or if you purchase them, which you can purchase, distribute them around your garden areas. Uh, they are a great biological control for other insects. They are a predator. They really like aphids. So if you have aphids in your gardens, you can purchase lacewing eggs and go ahead and have them scattered. They, uh, they eat other types of insects, such as small caterpillars, larvae of some beetles, insect eggs, and mites. Um, a lot of it is also going to depend upon what stage of growth that they're in, depends upon the kind of insect size that they might go after. The one thing to think about with lace wings is ants really like lace wing eggs and the larva. So you might want to keep that in mind if you see a lot of ants that are, are going around uh, your, your lace wings. Um, you want, might want to try to get rid of the ants then perhaps in a very safe way that aren't isn't going to harm the lace wing. So let's look at this. So here's another picture. This is a great close-up picture. This is actually the egg. And then this little strand here actually attaches itself to either a branch or to the leaf of the plant that helps to protect each other because after they, they hatch, the larva can't really kind of climb up this thread. So that's a way of protecting themselves from their own cannibalizations. They um, can be found in great numbers. And again, they like the aphids and the mites. And that a uh, long strand is there, it's, as I said, as a protection for them. Uh, they will hatch, and again, they will eat just about anything that they encounter uh, that is part of their diet. And I think that's a really cool picture seeing that up close. So let's look at the larva. So the egg actually hatches out into this larva, and this is what it is. It's almost like a little bit of an alligator type of a shape. Notice there are spikes here. Um, they can be greenish, they can be brownish, they could be mottled, such as what you have the white here and the dark here and dark there. You'll also notice that this mouth part is a, it's called a mandible, but you can see how it kind of is, it's, is grabbing and pinching on this particular aphid. So this is a great picture to show the larva of the lacewing actually attacking an aphid, and then it's going to go ahead and consume it. And then this is what the actual adult will look like. Um, they're very delicate. They can be green or they can be brown. You'll notice that they do have a very small head. You'll also notice that their wings are longer than the full length of their actual body itself. The wings are, are really cool because they're predominantly clear. Uh, you can see the veins, very transparent, uh, hence the name lace wing. Um, and they can get a total of about a half an inch to about three quarters of an inch long. And that's what those little things are that were sticking off of the beet plant. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, that's great information. Remember that they are good and not so good insects. Uh -huh. And we can use those predators to clean up our, to uh, reduce the, the infestation of other insects. Our next topic is about fruit th thinning and uh, Patrick Bayer again will address this uh, topic. Patrick? Thank you, Ramon. Let me go ahead and bring up this presentation. Okay, can we see it, Ramon? Yeah, but you, there you go. Okay, very good. Let me hide the meeting controls. Okay, well, it's been a challenging uh, 12 months for, for peach farmers and peach growers, backyard peach growers, and 
We had cold weather in December that thinned out our peach crop. We had spring frost that thinned out our peach crop. But if you are one of those lucky people who are blessed with an abundant crop of peaches on your trees this spring, now is the time to think about removing some of that fruit. Now that might sound counterproductive. And, and in fact, I've had people gasp when I've suggested this, but it's important to think about thinning peach crops because peaches, if left to their own devices, will set an abundant crop of fruit and too much fruit can lead to problems. So why would you want to thin off excess fruit? Well, one reason is to improve fruit quality. And if you remove excess fruit and allow just a small part of the uh, original fruit set to develop into peaches, they'll be larger in size, they'll have better eating qualities. Um, another important reason to thin is to reduce the risk of limb breakage. And we can see that clearly in this lower picture. This tree has entirely too much fruit on it. And peach wood is brittle and branches will break under the weight of excess fruit. Now, thinning starts with pruning. If we look at this picture here, we can see a peach shoot that has lots of small shoots branching off of it, and each of those small shoots has an abundant set of fruit. And if you had pruned those small shoots off during the pruning process in midwinter, that obviously would remove some of these excess flower buds, which resulted in excess fruit. So thinning can actually be an important aid in thinning off the fruit, the excess fruit on a peach tree. Now, some people are advocating thinning blossoms, going through and knocking the flowers off. This is risky in Missouri because they're never really sure of the uh, amount of fruit set until well past the flowering period. We can have frosts as late as early May in some parts of Missouri. And with peaches flowering in, in, uh, in late March, early April, there's always the risk of frost damage to those fruit that do set. So for home peach growers in particular, uh, it's, it's not encouraged to thin blossoms. It is, however, important to thin the excess fruit. Now, when is the best time to thin that fruit off? Well, if we look at these little peaches that we see in this photo here, peaches grow very quickly after they've been pollinated. And they reach a point called shuck split. And if you notice the small fruit in this picture, you'll see the uh, papery remains of the blossom are being shed from the developing fruit. Basically, the fruit grows so quickly, expands, splits that uh, those blossom remnants and drop and they drop off. And this is called shuck split. And this is a good time to start thinning peaches. Generally, the peaches are about a dime to a, to a nickel in size at this point. Now you wanna complete your thinning before the pits within the fruit begin to harden. And that's happening right now. So if you haven't thinned, right now is the time to go out and do your thinning. And typically the uh, pits begin to harden at about quarter size. When is the best time during the day? Best time to thin is when um, we have a dry day and no rain is expected for several days following. Thinning is, is an operation that can lead to tree damage and trees recover better if uh, there are several dry days after the thinning process. Now, how much should you take off? You wanna space your fruit eight to 12 inches apart. Uh, research has shown that each developing peach needs about 20 leaves dedicated to that particular peach for proper growth and development. Try to put your peaches on the lower parts of long shoots. If you have one large peach at the very end of a thin willowy shoot, there's a good chance that shoot will break. And also try to put your fruit in the sun. Goodness, that was and, uh, if you have any fruit that has been damaged by insects at this point, it makes sense to remove that fruit as well. So if we look at this branch here, you can see there's lots of peaches upon it, but a branch this size, can only uh, support three peaches. And you can see where the arrows are. Those are the three that we're going to select. And all the rest are gonna drop off. You can see all those yellow arrows that we're removing a lot of peaches. In fact, in a tree with a full set of fruit, you can remove nine out of 10 of the peaches and still have a good crop of fruit on your tree. And this is what the ground should look like. Uh, in commercial orchards, the uh, farmers will, will strike the trees with padded sticks, rubber hoses, or ropes to thin the fruit off. Uh, and then they go back and touch up with by hand. In a home orchard, it's much more practical to thin by hand. So go out, grab each little peach that you're going to remove, give it a gentle twist, and it'll pop right off. It's been my experience that most home peach growers don't do a, an adequate job of thinning the first go around. So it's a good practice to go back about a week after your first thinning effort and thin off any excess fruit that you missed the first time around. So that ends the uh, 
the discussion of peach thinning. If you haven't done it yet and you have excess fruit on your trees, now is the time to take care of thinning. Thank you, Patrick. That was very good. Uh, time to, to thin my peaches. Um, our next topic will be about whole terminology, and Debbie will talk about that. Yeah, I always like doing this um, just to see what everybody, their knowledge is, as well as my own knowledge, because sometimes I come across words still in horticulture, and I was like, what does that really mean? So here it is. The term is vernalization. Does it mean scratching a seed to aid in germination? the number of hours of darkness a plant needs in order to bloom, chilling hours to aid a plant in its growth. So what A, B, or C, which one of those do you believe is, is the correct answer? I'll give us just a couple more seconds here. Tamara's always good and Pong are at doing a countdown. Okay, just one, two, three. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Um, let's see, it says 52% of you believe that it's B, the number of hours of darkness a plant needs in order to bloom. 26% uh, say chilling hours to aid a plant in its growth. And the other 22% say scratching a seed to aid in germination. So let's actually see what is the answer. And the answer is chilling hours. Um, so each plant, uh, a lot of plants out there will need a certain amount of temperature change or fluctuation and a total number of hours of that fluctuated temperature change in order for it to break a dormancy or to sprout or to flower or to bear fruit. For example, as Patrick was just talking, fruit trees, uh, in order for them to, to actually have fruit develop, they need about two to 400 hours of cool, chilled winter temperatures in order to successfully bear fruit for the next year. So vernalization is a plant requiring a change in a temperature to a certain degree, usually 32 to 45 degrees, in order for it to break some kind of a dormancy, whether they're going to, um, the seed is going to actually start sprouting, the uh, plant is actually going to bear fruit, or the plant is actually going to flower. So good job, everybody. Always happy and love to do this one. Thank you, Debbie. And I would like to add that it's not only in fruit trees. There are some plants like garlic that they, knew, they need some vernalization hours at cold temperatures uh, to be able to produce more uh, cloves. If it doesn't have that, you're going to have uh, just one big garlic and not cloves in it. Uh, Patrick can uh, have uh, some inputs on that too. No, you're you're absolutely right. And for example, if you have uh, good intentions to plant garlic in the fall, and for whatever reason you don't get it done, and you have those bulbs, you know, just there on hand, put them into the refrigerator. Let them uh, receive some of their chilling, you know, which is what we're describing here, and then you can plant those out early in the following spring, and you'll still have a reasonable garlic harvest. Thank you, Patrick. So then we're gonna go to our next topic is I see sick plants. Peng? Yes, sir. Thank you, Ramon. Hello, everyone. My name is Peng Tian. I'm a director of Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Welcome to the I see sick plants. Um, today, I need you, everyone, to be the detective to find the murder for this plant disease. So this is a photo I took from our National Plant Diagnostic, Diagnostic Network. And uh, as you can see, that uh, there are four variety plants. One of them is completely dead. The other one has some internal yellowing. The two on the background looks better. So the client is asking, um, basically the diagnostician is uh, 
quoting the client's words to ask, uh, one of four of the homeowners green giant that provided trees has died. The homeowner wants to know whether the remaining arborvitaes are in danger of the same fit. Based on the diagnostic clues in the photo, what do you tell them? So I gotta put this photo again, and uh, I gotta have a poll for you to vote. What could be the cause? What caused the death of this tree? So I give you some time for the poll. Uh, do we have a poll here? Oh yeah. Thank you, Jared. So you can drag the poll window and then review the photo. I give you some hints. Look for some detail. From the, yeah, I saw there maybe people still need some time to, to think to survey the whole image, right? I give you maybe 10 seconds. Yeah, nobody select bacteria. That's good. <laughs> All right. I think I will end the poll and uh, I'm going to share the poll. Looks like uh, it's uh, the first of four has very even number. And we are, the answer was very spread it out. Okay. Let me, before I show you the answer, let me show you something. So this is the poll. If you look at this photo, you zoom in, you saw there's a patch of some type of mushroom here. And they're not just one patch. There's one here, one, there are two here. And that may be the reason this tree is dying, right? So the answer is fungus. So we have six or seven people give me the right answer. This is called Amilaria root rot. The common name is called honey mushroom, which is shown in this photo. They look cute. The color looks like a newly baked bread, make me really want to go to eat my lunch. So basically to diagnose this disease, first, the mushroom is very characteristic and diagnostic to identify that. If you saw this mushroom growing in your yard, you need to uh, be on alert. I saw those mushrooms a lot when I uh, walk in the trail uh, here in Columbia, Missouri, and uh, they are actually everywhere. The second one for, for the diagnostic tips is the size, which is the uh, flat white sheet of fungal mats uh, in between the bark and the wood. I always love this color because sometimes they're too white. It show me some kind of shiny and golden color, but they're everywhere and easy to peel. If you have this level of the contamination or infection, the tree will likely die in about two or three years. Another uh, symptom or signs you call that is the uh, fungal strands, which are showing in this photo. They're thick, black, like a shoe strings. They also grow in the, normally in the base of the tree. If you have all the three, I'm pretty sure 95% they are amylaria root rot. Unfortunately for this disease, there's no cure uh, for the treatment. If you have the infection at this level, you have to think about the stability of the tree. I think about the plan to cut it because over time it will keep weakening the tree and it may fall anytime. So I know there's some question about what if uh, I have a mushroom growing uh, like on the trunk, what should I do? Unfortunately, depends on the, depends on different type of the uh, uh, mushroom, but the tree will likely die because every time you saw the mushroom growing out from the roots or the trunk, that means the mycelia, which is the vegetative structure of the mushroom already penetrated into the vascular system of the trunk. So the tree may likely die, but it really depends on the condition of the tree uh, for, uh, uh, for how many years it can uh, survive. That actually leads to another disease management is to keep your tree healthy with good watering and irrigation. Let the tree fight this battle against the mushroom. And uh, you may, help the tree to prolong um, its uh, lifetime if you have a good management for, uh, for your tree. So that's all I have. If you have any question regarding wood rot disease or mushroom, feel free to send me photos. I would love to take a look. Thank you, have a good day.
Thank you, Peng. I have a question. Do you know if the mushroom of Almilaria is edible? That's a very good question. I actually don't know, and I would not like to eat it. <laughs> actually, I just looked into the in the website, and it is edible. It's a, the group is called the honey fungus. But it could be a little, a little uh, problematic. Some people get a uh, stomach upset with it, so you have to be careful. But it seems like, uh, in general, they are edible. That's very good information. Thank you. I didn't know that. I just looked into it. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Pang. Um, our next topic is then uh, what blooming in the native garden, what's blooming today in the native garden? And Kathy will address this uh, uh, topic. Okay, let me get my, um, whoops. Looking for my shares. Uh, there we go. Okay. So what's in bloom in the native garden? I uh, visited my sister uh, this past weekend uh, near the Merrimack River in uh, West County, um, St. Louis. And we have been working in her yard for the last eight to 10 years to create a, a native oasis. And um, so I was just so impressed with everything that was blooming. The, this, however, is in my yard. And I'll just ask if anybody knows what it is and we'll... Um, see at the end. Probably many of you do know what it is. So uh, one thing that was blooming in her yard was a blanket flower. It is a long, it's also called Indian blanket. It is a long blooming, it has a long bloom. It likes sun, it reseeds. Uh, they don't, like many natives, they don't do as well in rich soil as uh, they do uh, in a very rich soil. So uh, birds and butterflies like it. Another thing that was blooming was Coreopsis, a very popular plant that you see in a lot of gardens. Also sunny, easy to grow, um, and a perfect Missouri plant. It uh, tolerates heat, drought, and humidity. Uh, Indian pink is one that I am not very familiar with, and uh, and actually it's not as common. But in it, it grows uh, more in moist woods and along stream banks, but it can also be used in your garden. It will need more water than some other of the native plants. It uh, does uh, bloom, however, from late spring into June. And that bloom on it reminds me a little of the coral honeysuckle bloom. So my guess is that the... Uh, the hummingbirds may like this plant, and I'm sure uh, other pollinators do as well. And there is the coral honeysuckle. And if you've heard me talk at all, uh, I always mention the coral honeysuckle. It's one of my favorite um, native plants, and I finally got one. I got one this weekend, and I'm going to plant it this coming weekend. And it is a hummingbird magnet. And um, there's other... Uh, hummingbirds, um, uh, butterflies, there's other uh, pollinators that uh, like it too, but the, the hummingbirds really like it. And she had a lot of bee balm blooming and I did not get uh, very many pictures. And, um, and she's got some other bee balm uh, that's going to be blooming soon that comes in a little in uh, different colors. Also some sweet William, which is a uh, kind of phlox. And behind it, um, there's some other phlox that'll be uh, blooming later on, probably in another week or two. So did anybody guess that this was the tulip poplar? It's one of our native trees. It's in my front yard and it is covered this year in these beautiful blooms. And I was at an event on Saturday, a master gardener event, and the woman sitting next to me said, showed me a picture of her tree. She goes, it is covered this year. So, and indeed, so is mine. That's all I have.
Thank you, Kathy. And that, that was good. And my wife bought a lot of tulips, Poplar. They grow fast. I mean, we planted back in Virginia, some and in, in uh, three years, it was over the house. So they grow fast. Yes. Anyway, our next topic is uh, dividing spring flowering bulbs. And Donna is going to address this topic. Donna? Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so one of the common questions I have that um, I get is my spring flowering bulbs are blooming less and less every year. What should I do about it? And so that is always a great question because it, it brings up a lot of important things to talk about. Um, you know, one is the bulb foliage is very important. Um, I know a lot of people have a tendency to chop down that, that bulb foliage as soon as the blooms are done. And we're talking about early spring blooms, like, you know, the tulips, the daffodils, the crocus, things like that. But remember that bulb foliage is needed to feed that bulb. And otherwise it might not bloom as well in following years. Um, so basically just some tips you want to deadhead after the blooms fade, of course. Um, then you want to feed with an all-purpose fertilizer. Um, and then wait at least six weeks uh, before removing any of that foliage. So you want to wait until it starts to yellow, and then you can do something about it. I know I get this question all the time as well. Can I braid it? Can I bend it? Can I tie it? Well, really, no. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it disrupts the natural flow of nutrients and moisture, um, and, and, it, and it keeps that plant from being able to make that energy um, and feed the bulbs. And feeding that bulbs it's what is, is what's part of what's going to cause those bulbs to be successful every single year. And so if another way, a reason why they may fail to bloom also is because they become too crowded. And so at that point, you might consider even dividing them if you notice that the plants have multiplied over the years and it's just become overcrowded. So the tips for that is, you know, you want to definitely, once again, wait those six weeks, wait for that foliage to yellow. Um, then you're going to come back and you're going to lift those bulbs out of the ground um, using a spade or, you know, uh, some type of shovel or a, a, a fork, you know, a, a um, um, you know, any, anything that's going to pull them up. You could use hand trowels even. Um, you can either, once you get those bulbs up and you divide them, um, keep in mind that there's going to be one mother bulb in the middle and um, two offsets. And the offsets are actually um, bulbs or babies, what, you know, as we can say, and you want, you can remove those offsets and replant those. Um, so you have a couple different options once you've um, dug them up and divided them. You can either replant them right away or you can dry and store and plant them in the fall. Now, the reason why you would want to do it right away is, you know, you know, this bulb foliage disappears. And so it's going to be hard to find those bulbs later and have the exact spot. So if, if you would want to dig them later, make sure to flag it, mark it, stake it. Uh, but my recommendation is go ahead and dig them, go ahead and, and try to um, either replant them right away or dry and store them away for the fall and then replant them in the fall. However, research is showing there's no real advantage to holding them um, other than, you know, your timing might not allow for right away planting or you may be developing a new planting spot. And so just keep those in mind. Um, you know, the other thing I might answer, might mention is that the fact that the offsets are small, immature bulbs, and they can take a couple years um, to bloom. So don't be in a hurry when you transplant or you, you know, uh, you are um, thinning these, that it may take a while for that bloom to come back. Okay, that is all I have. Okay, so I guess at this point we will close out. Um, let me get my slide back up.
Okay, and so that concludes today's uh, garden hour. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Just remember that um, if you missed part of the presentation or you want to go back and watch other previous episodes, you can actually go to our YouTube uh, live stream um, and you, they are all listed there. Or if you want to go back and watch some of the video snippets, they're great for review or if you want continuing education, great information there. So just go to the YouTube IPM, um, MU IPM page and it's all right there. Um, if you choose to um, save the chat, just remember you can just open your chat, go to the right hand uh, bottom part of the box to the three dots in the lower right and you click on those dots and it will give you an option to save that chat. And so uh, just uh, once again, here is our state map as we showed you earlier. Um, and um, just remember that we're back to Wednesdays at noon. And so we will all come back and join together on May 31st at noon um, to see what new questions we have. And I hope everybody has a good afternoon and, and uh, take care. <laughs>